homage to the lineage gurus, homage to the venerable Mang Mao Liao Ming, homage to Master Sajia Zheng Kong, homage to the 16 Dharma King Kamapa, and homage to Master Tupton Torji, homage to the three jewels of the altar, and homage to the main deity of Homa today, Vajra Kilaya. Sumo. All Dhamma educators, Dhamma teachers, Dhamma instructors, Dhamma assistants, um, temple directors, all disciples present here and over the internet and our participating VIPs today uh, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan, Secretary General Liao's wife, Dhamma sister Judy. Accountant to the Buddha Foundation, Dharma Sister Teresa and her husband Larry. Producers for the Kenny Tensang Shinton from CTITV Taiwan, Dharma Sister Rebecca Shiachi. And uh, anchor woman and an ac actress from Singapore, Dharma Sister Eileen. And Dharma Sister Vivian Sit. From Surabaya, Indonesia, Kuang Ming Lezang Temple, uh, Lianhua Su Jian and family. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How do you do? I would like to make an announcement. Next uh, Sunday, October 11th at 3 p.m., there would be Raga Raja Homa Fire Offering Ceremony. And the mudra for Raga Raja is like this, uh, inward. There are many mudras like this. This, when the two middle fingers are separate, this is the basic mudra of Siddhi Garbha. It's also called the Vajra to tooth, teeth. And when the tip are touching each other, that's for Yamantaka. And when they are crossing like one third, at the one third of the fingers, that's and touching each other, that's uh, Raga Raja. And when the two middle fingers are upright, very straight, and touching each other, that's for Vajrakilaya. So Vajrakilaya, Siddhigarbha, Vajratith, Raga Raja, Yamantaka. So just this mudra, there are already uh, five, four or five different deities, mudras for the And Vajra Kilaya are very upright, very straight upright. So it's, it's like a purba or a dagger, a single prong scepter. And for Ragaraja, we don't need to say much. Who wants to become the primary supplicants or not? Because this is a great um, magnetizing deity with great power, so that if a couple is not harmonious, then you need to practice this. Or if you would like to uh, get to know a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or you want love, then you practice this deity. Or if you want a great uh, magnetization, say to be a president, then you also practice this. 
or if you want to be an entertain in entertainment business or celebrity, then you also practice this. You want to have lots of fans, or if you want to have lots of people uh, supporting you or helping you, or if you need a good spiritual companion or to be to succeed in your spiritual cultivation, you also need this deity. And also for career and good business, you also need to this deity. Or at school, so that you have a lot of people helping you and supporting you, and your professors like you, you also need this deity. So if you're a farmer and you need a lot of uh, employees or laborers or you need your family or relatives to be nice and kind to you, you also need this deity. So the employees that you get uh, would be very helpful and get the job done really well. You need this deity. Or if you have business and you have lots of customers and lots of uh, business, then you need this deity. If you don't need any of the above, then you don't need the prime to become primary supplicant. Ragaraja is the same as Guru Gule. Uh, they are magnetizing uh, deities or gods of love at Tributa School. This too have great power. And today we want to talk about the main deity of Homa. Dolce Purba. So Dolce Purba is highly uh, revered, highly respected in the four orders of Tibetan Tantrayana. And th the most important one is the Nyingmapa, which is the old sect or the red school. Most uh, high High, uh, highly revere Dorje Purpa the most. Uh, Master Lian Fu yesterday told me, uh, please talk more about Dorje Purpa. So let me talk about his origin. In India, you know, in uh, Tantrayana, we often mention about the eight uh, great cemeteries or the Sitavana Cemetery. The original uh, head there has three heads, six arms, and four feet, and two wings. So the king of ghosts with great power so he was the the head or the master of the Sitavana cemetery in India. And this master had harmed a lot of sentient beings. So Dorje Purba was the uh, powerful king of ghosts. So he would call on storms or great wind storm and kill a lot of people and toppled a lot of trees and created earthquake and famine. And so he created lots of bad karma. So he devastated a lot of sentient beings. And then later on, there was a Karma Heruka. That's his name. He was a great Heruka. And according to the legend, he came from the Adibuddha or the Samantabhadra Tathagata. And he was called Karma Heruka. He transformed himself in order to subdue Dorje Purba. 
So he transformed to become exactly like the Dorje Bulba with three heads, six arms, four legs, and two wings. And then he fought with the original Dorje Purba. And eventually, Karma Heruka subdued him. And then uh, he first uh, subjugated uh, the Vajra Kilikilaya, possesses him and then ask him to support the sentient beings, to protect sentient beings. That was f the first one. And then the second one, in Guru Padmasambhava's uh, Dharma propagation, one time he went to uh, the border of Nepal in a cave with a Nepalese princess called Sakya Deva, Deva, and we also have a reference De Hua. This Nepalese princess was called Sakya Devi. Sakya Devi and Guru Padmasambhava were inside a cave practicing a supreme Dharma and there were three demons obstructing them. And the powers of these three demons are tremendous. So in their Dharma practice, they created a lightning and hail, earthquake, and also famine. So Guru Padmasambhava were, was obstructed by these three demons, Maras. So finally, Guru Padmasambhava invoked Vajra Kilikilaya and uh, chased away, expelled the three demons and then that place became very uh, peaceful and they succeeded in their Dharma practice. So, really strange. What did Guru Padmasambhava and the Nepalese princess uh, perform in the Dharma practice? It was not written very clearly, but this kind of spiritual cultivation is is supreme where the two bodies would radiate lights. That's the spiritual cultivation of a Mahasiddha. But if it is not the spiritual cultivation of a Siddha or Mahasiddha, whether you're in a cave or on a retreat in a seclusion, so if if they are not the siddhas, they are not the ones with attainments, and they perform such uh, such thing, then they would uh, emit black smoke or negative energy. But the siddhas or the one with attainments would emit lights, and you would have attainments. So, but if you don't have attainments and you do that, then you would fall into Vajra hell. So that's the difference between whether you have attainment or not in performing the practice. So, uh, this is the Vajra Purba, one, two, three, with three faces. So this is a Dorje Purba or Purba Scepter. The white face symbolizes Yamantaka. The red face is Hayagriva, Hayagriva, the horse head Heruka. 
and the black face is Vajrapani. Vajrapani. So this is uh, the union of the three alliances, and that is also called Torji Purba. It has tremendous majestic power, divine spiritual power. So Yamantaka, Hayagriva, and Vajrapani. So it embodies uh, three great Herukas, and this is the dagger, or we call it Purba or we call it Purba Scepter or Purba Dagger. Purba Chu or Purba Jie. So a Siddha can carry this traveling around in Tibet and tie it to your belt and you carry it with you at all time. Guru Parmasambhava once took this uh, Purba Dorje and was drinking at a bar. And Guru Padmasambhava drank a lot of wine and he didn't get drunk. But he didn't have any money with him. So the beautiful uh, lady boss told Guru Padmasambhava, I heard that you have great supernatural power. If you showed me uh, your miraculous power, then you don't have to pay for your drinks. But if you cannot show it to me, then I need to get money from you. So Guru Padmasambhava took this uh, Purba Dorji from his belt. There's sun rays right there where a few uh, renunciates are sitting and also a few ladies over there. There are two spots there with sun rays on tops of the reference heads, shiny. And that l person with the white a silvery hair was shiny in the sun ray, sunlight, sunlight. So Guru Padmasambhava took this Dorje Purva and in that bright spot he stick it. And the sun was about to set. But the sun was packed by the Dorje Purba, and the sun stopped and stayed at the same spot even until 3 a.m. in the morning. So that's how how one how amazing Guru Padmasambhava and Dorje Purba were. You could try it at home. So the sun was packed, so the sun couldn't uh, set, couldn't come down. It was kind of uh, packed by the Dorje Purba. And in it, there's Yamantaka, Hariya Griva, and Vajrapani. So he showed his uh, transcendental power. So the lady boss didn't get money from him, and instead, ask him to stay and drink free drinks and also perform that uh, supreme practice. And that was his story in the legend, in the records, in the records. And Guru Padmasambhava could also be in union with Dorje Purba. So the one where Guru Padmasambha was in union with Vajakilaya, we call him Guru Jilijilaya, 
Hom Hom Be. And the mantra is Guru Jili Jilaya Hom Hom Be. That's the union of Guru Rinpoche and Vajrakilaya. And one time, Guru Padmasambhava followed his 25 disciples and Ishichoka, the 25 ministers, and Ishichoka, his consort, went to a cliff. And Guru Padmasambhava appeared or demonstrated the mandala of 13 Dorje Purbars. And Guru Padmasambhava asked all the disciples, do you first pay homage to me or to the mandala of Dorje Purba? And his disciples thought, we see Guru Rinpoche every day and we pay homage to him every day. But today, the mandala, the supreme mandala of 13 Dorje Purbas appeared. So we should pay homage to the Dorje Purba first. So all 25 disciples paid homage to the mandala of Dorje Purba. Only Ishichoga, Ishichoga, she said, I always pay homage to Guru Padmasambhava, and all my affinity with the Dharma comes from Guru Padmasambhava. All Dharma comes from Guru Padmasambhava. So I would still pay homage to Guru Padmasambhava. And after she did that, Guru Padmasambhava said, all 25 of you who paid homage to Vajakilaya, 13 Vajakilikilaya's mandala, and only Ishi Chogal paid homage to Guru Padmasambhava. So this Dharma will be transmitted to Ishi Chogal in the future. So the 13 Vajakilaya Dharma practice was transmitted to Ishi Chogal. So what this meant was all Dharma uh, origin comes from your own lineage root guru. So all Dharma, the origin of all Dharma comes from your lineage root guru. So as a result, Guru Padmasambhava transmitted the Dharma of Dorje Purba to Ishichogal. So that's why the lineage root guru is the origin of all Dharma. Recently, something interesting happened. I said, interesting, fun, I will not speak language from other places, but it is an interesting story, but also a true story. There was a chapter that is uh, planning to change their look. So this chapter is about to become a temple and change um, their look and would look dignified and beautiful, bought all the shops and open, uh, break down the walls and turn them into a Lijang temple. And the responsible people of the chapter came here and told me, Scrum Master, I want to change it to become a beautiful Lijang temple with the feel of a temple. And But the group of people who uh, disagreed and said, we could just change the door. Uh, but the, di the director wanted to change everything about it. So 
the other people went to ask the hobbit, who was that? Of all the Tribuda masters, who would be the hobbit? Master Hui Jun is the hobbit. And Master Hui Jun uh, consulted Simu. Maybe there's some misunderstandings uh, in the communication here between many people. So Master Hui Jun said, Simu said, just change the door, it's fine, according to Simu. And then the person responsible came to me and asked me, uh, how to do it and I said just change everything and I signed my name Sung Yen and the date and then this uh, head uh, give it uh, to the board of directors and after they met they agreed to follow Simu's uh, direction not to follow Grandmaster's direction because Simu's not here, so I can say. So don't follow Sidran's directions, just follow Simu's directives. So when I heard that, I thought it was funny because Simu meant to change everything, but I don't know, something's missing in the communication that they said that. To just to change the the doors, and they wanted to follow Simu's direction, so that would be problematic. I thought that was really funny. I didn't say anything. Well, whatever, go ahead. Simu is precious. First, she's precious. Second, she's capable. Third, her judgments are always right. So when Grandmaster disagree with Simu, Grandmaster has to listen to Simu. Very simple like that. So Simu's uh, directive says to just change doors, that's fine too. But actually she wasn't like that. She said that she wanted to be like me, changing everything. But I don't know how, why they thought Simu asked them to just change the doors. So what's funny is the disciples were following Simu and not following Si Zun, not following Grandmaster. Then you are creating discord between Simu and Grandmaster. So what's the, what are you doing? You want us to fight or argue? No, I, I never fight. I never fight. But you're making us argue with each other? That's not good. But that's also really funny. Like the issue with Dorje Burba. All origins of Dharma come from the lineage of Guru. So, the Dorje Purba's divine power is tremendously great because there are three Vajrapani, Yamantaka, Hayagriva, Dorje Purba or Purba Scepter. As you know, these three deities represent not just Yamantaka, Hayagriva, and Vajrapani. These three Hedukas also have origins, and they are backers. The back support are great. The white face is Yamantaka, and his uh, sub back support is uh, Manjushri. And above Manjushri is Amitabha, 
still of one lay, one line, one lineage. Amitabha Manjushri Yamantaka. And the red face, Hayagriva, the horse head Heruka, also has great origins. Behind him is Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, and above is the Zheng Fa Ming Tathagata, Tathagata with the correct Dharma readings. And Vajapanis, above him is Vajrasattva. And then, even further up, would be Adi Buddha. So, Dorje Purba. By receiving the empowerments of Dorje Purba, it's the same as you are receiving blessings from all the above deities. So, the primary supplicants were truly fortunate. And the registrants are secondary, but also still very fortunate. And if you're none of those, if you receive the empowerments, that's the third level of fortune. And if you don't get any of those, no empowerments and no registrations, then you could say that they are very unfortunate. They are almost unfortunate. The origin is incredible. The Adi Buddha, Vajrasattva, Vajrapani. Amitabha, Manjushri Bodhisattva, Yamantaka. The proper Dharma, Radiant Statakata, Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, Hayagriva. So the empowerment this time is the same as receiving empowerments from these nine deities. Oh, that's uh, boundless uh, Dharma power and boundless uh, majestic power. So is this good, saying it this way? Now you know. You know, the 13 Vajra Kilayas, actually, Ishichoga had affinity with the Dharma of the 13 Vajra Kilayas. But five of them, the altars of five of them were set up wrongly. So it became the Dharma affinity with the eight Vajrakilikilayas. So five of the altars were set up wrong. So from 13, it became only eight Vajrakilayas. So Ishichogal only received the transmissions of eight Vajrakilayas Dharma. And in Tribuda school, there is only one master who received the empowerment of eight Vajrakilaya. Now only one, only one master received the eight Vajrakilaya empowerment. And the empowerment is at the, br at the tip of the crown, at the brow point, at throat, at the heart, at the navel chakra, at the secret chakra, and at both shoulders. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. How many? Eight. Eight deities. One at the top, one at the brow, one at the throat, one at the heart, one at the navel chakra, one at the secret chakra, and one each at the shoulders. Only one person received this empowerment. I wouldn't mention who, but there's only one. And the setup of the altar is different. You need eight altars to perform the eight empowerments. Now let's continue on the Great Perfection Dharma.
that significant moment occurred when three quarters of the night has passed. When three quarters of the night has passed, that's about dawn, the time of dawn. During, during the last quarter, a bright star appeared in the east. Prince Siddhartha fixed his gaze on the bright star and his wisdom was dawn. The light of his com heart, the light of his heart completely shined forth while the star shone brightly in the sky. In a split of a moment, he attained Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. At the moment Prince Siddhartha gained enlightenment, the night was silent and all sentient beings were fast asleep. They were not awakened. So at that time, Prince Siddhartha wrote a verse. The night has passed three quarters. At the last quarter, I saw a bright star. Sentient beings are not awakened yet and not starting practicing. It is time for the great, holy, unexcelled one. If all is extinguished, that's gaining enlightenment. And since the time of Dipamkara Buddha, his is Sakyamuni Buddha. So seeing the star is like this. So a huge star appeared in the sky, shining upon Sakyamuni Buddha. This is also mentioned in the Bible. Something like this was also mentioned in the Bible. When he was born in Bethlehem, there was a huge star shining upon him. And three kings, seeing the star, riding on the camels, following the star, and come, and offered uh, three treasures to Jesus. It was mentioned in the in the Bible and Sakyamuni Buddha when he gained enlightenment when he attained the perfect enlightenment there was a huge star shining upon him so uh, that's uh, seeing the bright star in the middle of the night and Grandmaster's birth is similar to Jesus uh, Jesus was in a horse stall and Grandmaster was in the chicken coop. And when I was born, there was a bright light upon me. <laughs> but that was just kidding. Because at that time, it was an air raid uh, by the American Air Force upon Taiwan. So we were running away. We were on. We were refugees, and we went to New Chou's uh, stream in Jiayi, in a chicken coop, to hide from the raid. That the town of Jiayi was in fire because they were bombarded uh, by the American Air Force, because Taiwan was under the occupation of Japan. Uh, during the Second World War. That was 1945, June 27th, according to Gregorian calendar. And the, the lunar calendar is the 18th of the fifth month. And at that time, uh, electricities were prohibited. So no lights and no stars even in the sky were prohibited. So the, Amer the U.S. Air Force were bombing and the whole city of Jiayi was in fire. And you said that there was a huge star, star uh, shining on you? Is it like complete uh, boasting? No. Yes and no. Because at that time there was 
we couldn't find a nurse. And my dad was a Japanese soldier, and he had a knife with him. Oh, and then he got a midwife. It's just like a midwife, like a nurse. And and he knocked at her door, and she said, "Oh no, no, no! I couldn't help because uh, we we're being bombed. How could I try that? Please open the door." And then my dad said, "Open the door," and he was a, a Japanese soldier uh, c carrying a, a knife. My dad is a Taiwanese, but he joined the Japanese military. So when she saw a Japanese, uh, someone that looked like a Japanese soldier with a knife, so she decided to go. So the midwife followed my father to go to that chicken coop in the New Chou River by the New Chou Stream. Uh, but there's no lights, so my dad took a flashlight, and it was really bright. See, it's like the huge, a bright star shining on me, like two stars over here shining on me. Because there, were, there were no lights. There was no lights everywhere else. Only above me, there was light. So wasn't that a miracle? So at that time, I also saw a bright star in the middle of the night, and suddenly I gained enlightenment and attained Anuttarak Samyak Sambodhi. I attained the way. That was fun. Why is it when the bright star shines on you, you would gain sudden enlightenment? Sakyamuni Buddha saw the bright star in the east. Jesus also saw the bright star in the east, and I was also born in the east. I also saw uh, the bright light of a flashlight, and also gained sudden enlightenment. When I was born, the midwife used a flashlight on me and. This couldn't be a human being. What would it be then? The whole body. The old bodhisattva with silver hair. So it's like that silvery thread, white thread, enshrouded uh, the whole baby when I was born. Uh, my mother was seven months pregnant, and I was enshrouded by that white th thread. How could something so strange was born? So the midwife thought, oh, uh, and she used uh, some oil to rub off that white thread, and there was a baby inside. That baby was me. That's how it was. As I heard my mom told me. Though with a seven-month pregnancy, you could still, they could still live, but if you're eight months uh, pregnant, then you couldn't live. You can't live. Why is that? Have you heard of that? So if you're born prematurely, eight months, then you would not be able to live. But seven months, you can. And I was seven months. There are a lot of interesting things. When I was born, the midwife also said, this is not a human being. What is it then? A Buddha. Amitabha. 
So that really was a bright star shining on me. That was real, but that was the light of the flashlights. So you attain the liberation of the wisdom. So in this case, you have no complaints and no regrets, nothing to complain about. Let me share a joke first. Um, the, <laughs> the dairy cow said that so many people drink my milk, but nobody called me mom. That's her complaint. And the octopus said that I have lots of inks, but I was called the thief because that's the sound in Chinese. This is play of words of Chinese. A kangaroo. Yeah, this is only meaningful in Chinese. They're all complaining. Dinosaurs. The scorpions were complaining that it has too many feet, can't afford to buy all the shoes. And there's a porcupine. And the male and the female porcupine said, uh, I really want to, uh, to feel how it's like to be hugging your loved ones. So everybody's complaining. So most people in this world are complainers. They always complain. But if you're not a human being, and you have gained the Anuttarak Samyak Sambodhi, the perfect and complete enlightenment, then you would know there is nothing to complain about. Today, you suffer from catastrophes, a great a slanders, defamations, or some uh, demonic. Uh, problems, uh, you, you still don't need to complain. Once you gain enlightenment in your spiritual cultivation, you would feel this way, nothing to complain about, completely nothing. And you have no complaints and no regrets. But before you reach such a state, you still complain. You still complain. Who has no complaints? in your heart. You have no complaints whatsoever toward this life. Everything is fine. Everything is the best arrangement. Anyone? No one. Everybody still have complaints in their hearts, especially those grudge women Woman that holds grudges. Oh, the husband's not nice to me. He's not back home for the whole night. He insulted, whatever, you know. There's all kinds of complaints about the husband or the family. The husband doesn't like me anymore. He used to be like that and now is like this. Of course, there's a difference between the past and now. So lots of complaints. So, so those who hold grudges. Because human beings are not perfect, and you cannot have everything 
and everything perfect. But let me share a joke. When we, in the fairy tales, that the prince and the princess will live happily ever after. Really? Let me ask you, really? That from now on, or from then on, that the prince and princess will live happily ever after, and the fairy tale ends. Really? I don't think so. There would still be complaints. Uh, okay, uh, money, children, uh, health, affinity, and your position. So money, children, health, uh, position, and affinity. If you have all of this, and they're all perfect, that doesn't exist. So a human being always complains. But once you gain enlightenment, you have no complaints whatsoever. And no more complaints, no more regrets. Only this would be called enlightened. If you still bear grudges in your hearts, you still have regrets in your hearts, then you're not considered enlightened. So this is how I'm telling you. Think about it. What is enlightenment? What is enlightenment? What is the perfect awakening? What is anuttara samyak sambodhi? Someone went to a company for an interview, and the boss asked, why did you leave your last job? And he replied, because the company moved, and they didn't tell me the new address, the new location. A lot of people trying to find a job, and the boss would also ask, why did you leave your previous job? What would you say? You can say the same as that. The company moved, and they didn't tell me the new location. <sighs> you were asked to get out. How come you have no resentments in your heart? It is hard to find a job in America these days. So of course you still bear grudges in your heart. See, I'm so capable and skillful and wise. How come the company doesn't want you and doesn't want me anymore? That's not a joke. Uh, the boss asked uh, a new candidate, employee candidate, uh, what can you do? And uh, what is it that you cannot do? And he said only two things he's not able to do. But at the end, he cannot do, He there's nothing he, he can do. And he said, uh, you know, there are only two things that I cannot do, this and that. So he doesn't know anything. So that means he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know this, he doesn't know that. So the boss also complained. And one time the boss complained about an employee because he's always very slow in doing everything and very lazy. Whatever that you ask him to do is always very slow. 
And the boss was really mad and asked him, how is it that you can be faster? And then he stood up and said, I only get tired fast. He get tired fast. So can you use that kind of employee? So between employees and the, uh, the employers, they're always uh, against each other. Only when you have no complaints whatsoever, then that would be called enlightenment. And that would be the correct and perfect awakening, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. I cannot tell you what enlightenment is, but I got several key points that no complaints and no regrets whatsoever eternally. That would be called enlightenment. Never complaints and never regrets. Is this is also a joke. In the morning, get on the metro, and there was a loving couple that were in their own world and completely ignored everybody else. And Grandmaster saw that too. That, like on a subway, there were men and women just completely on each other, and their mouths are kissing each other and hugging each other. And a lot of people saw them walking by, but they just like that. And there was a young girl that told the man, I'm pregnant. And the man just was dumbfounded. And the woman glared at that young lady. And then people around them. And then the girlfriend slapped the boyfriend. And the young lady continued saying, because I was pregnant, could you please let me sit down? <laughs> See? You still don't trust each other. Although they, they love each other, they kiss each other so passionately and hug each other. And their hearts are together. But there was a young lady that said she was pregnant. And the woman started to doubt and slap him. So even with love, there's still hatred in it. And so love and hatred come from the same heart. Remember that, nothing to complain. And the most, uh, <laughs> the most annoying thing is to be bitten by mosquitoes and then you cannot bite them back. And then the wor worst that you have to slap yourself for it. There are lots of mosquitoes in Taiwan, but not so bad in Seattle. In Taiwan, we have to put on the mosquito uh, repellents, and then there's also the dengue fever now in Taiwan. And then in your sleep, you hear, and then you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After you slept so much, it's still oh. <laughs> mosquitoes are really quite annoying. So, as a human being, we need to have wisdom, and the highest wisdom is the complete and perfect awakening, which is the wisdom of the Buddha. And Buddha's wisdom is non-leaking. What does it mean? It's uh, 
it's no faults. It's uh, there's no shortcomings to it. It's perfect and complete. So one that gained such a wisdom would have no complaints whatsoever because he understood about everything.